Okay, hi everyone, and welcome back to Communist Radio. Uh, I'm Fiona Lally. I'm back on the podcast. They tried to get rid of me. Um, <laughs> no, they didn't try to get rid of me. But I've been on tour. I've been on. I've been on a Books Not Bombs tour. And today we're gonna we're gonna debrief from the tour. And I'm with Cal, the London organizer for the RCP, also frequent Communist Radio guest presenter yes. all Something of the above like <laughs> um so yeah we're gonna kind of debrief from the tour that i've been on and try and draw out the main political lessons and the main questions that have come up on the tour mm -hmm. but i think to start we should explain why we did this in the first place why books not bombs and i think we should say that this was really a development out of the general election campaign that we ran which was incredible you know over the summer and we used Books Not Bombs as a slogan, as a demand, because it really resonated, I would say, with the, th the three key issues that defined this election, which was Palestine, mm -hmm. austerity, and just hatred of the Tories, absolute disgust. Yeah. And so Books Not Bombs and Healthcare Not Warfare and what was the one you said? Arts Not am Ammunition. Arts, which doesn't roll off the tongue as well. No. But <laughs> Books not bombs, healthcare not warfare. Arts and not ammunition. I'm sure people get the gist. <laughs> it was our a way of of connecting with people about the issues that they cared about and linking it with with the system as a whole. Um, and also because we identified that there's a deep anger in society against the drive to war and militarism. And since the the tour began um, about six weeks ago now the drive to war across the world has only increased. It's got worse, for sure. I think um, people are really sick and tired of the warmongering that takes place on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And that's why people don't read the news. That's why people yeah. don't believe what politicians have to say. Yeah. Um, and I think that you're right. It's It's been a continuation of what we began with the election campaign. And it's only beginning to resonate more and more. And as more issues spill onto the streets of Britain, people are beginning to connect the dots in their minds and see that the rampant militarism on the one hand and the austerity on the other is all being carried out by a government that doesn't give a damn about the poor and oppressed here in Britain and certainly doesn't care about them across the world as well. Yeah, for sure. And that's why today the Palestine movement has, it's, it's almost like set a new standard for protest. It's set a new backbone to the left and especially hopefully the revolutionary left in Britain, um, I think what's really noticeable now is when you go to protests that aren't even about Palestine necessarily, there's a there's a Palestine contingent there. Yeah. But not only that, but like the same kind of traditions and ideas about the necessity for more than just reform yeah. are present. And that's because look, when you look at Palestine, everyone, well, most people can see you can't reform your way out of that. You mm -hmm. can't reform your way out of Zionism mm -hmm. and that we can get a, a lesser evil or a, no, a complete revolution, a complete sweeping away is what is necessary, right? And that idea of a revolution against the system is so present. And for example, earlier in the week, there was an emergency demonstration outside the Old Bailey after the news um, that Martin Blake, the police officer who shot Chris Caber yes. um, and killed him, um, had been acquitted, basically, mm. completely got away with it. And there was an emergency demonstration. And I know the comrades there was were talking about how at that protest, everyone was saying the problem is the whole rotten system. Yes. It's not one bad apple. The whole thing has to go. And then not even just talking about that, the role of the police in, in the system as a whole, like everywhere, everyone was just saying like, we need to sweep all of this away. There's just no illusions in reformism. Yes, yeah. I think that's definitely the case amongst a growing layer of young people in particular. Yeah. And uh, we learned a hard lesson in what the role of the state and what the role of the police is over the past year in their attempts to crack down on pro-Palestine voices, the way in which they weaponized that question, uh, obviously following the orders from above, from the Tory government and now the Labour government as well. Mm -hmm. So I think people are making the connection in that way. 
And I remember as being at that demonstration, that counter protest where the protesters didn't actually show up. They probably yeah. stayed in a pub um, for, for reasons of their own safety. <laughs> up in Walthamstow uh, yeah. over the summer when the far right were feeling very emboldened mm. and they, they said they were going to come um, and run amok on the streets. Tens of thousands of people showed up all across the country. I think there was about 10,000 people there in Walthamstow. Yeah. And the most radical part of that counter protest, if you want to call it that, was the uh, was the people with Bangladesh flags. With yeah. the, it was the health workers for Palestine that we've seen on various different demonstrations yeah. at rallies that were making the link and calling for revolution here at home, which I think is so significant. Yeah, 100%. Um, and, and I found all of these things that we've just spoken about have come up on this Books Not Bombs tour, right? Um, I mean, it's been interesting in different universities and different places, the discussion has gone on to different topics. But I remember in Sheffield, we spent a long time discussing the far right, actually, because it's so close to Rotherham, yeah, yeah. Um, where there was a particularly bad demonstration, um, riot. Um, and again, the same kind of conclusions being drawn, like connecting these things together and, and seeing like, we need a revolution against this whole system. Mm. And that's, yeah, that brings me on to also, you know, why did this Books Not Bombs tour focus on universities? Mm -hmm. And it's because universities are a, a hotbed <laughs> for this kind of pressure, this uh, struggle that is, mm. you know, emerging in society between, on the one hand, students, you know, a, a kind of open revolutionary layer in society, and some of the the perpetrators of the the drive to war and what we mean by that is like universities not only are they complicit in in the genocide in gaza um by violence, but also in terms of university departments the research that takes place and their connection with the arms industry they are directly participating yes. in, 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 the, in the curation of this, this war industry. Yeah. And yeah, I know this is something you've been investigating. Yeah, yeah, I've been doing a lot of reading around this. Um, and I wasn't even aware at just how enmeshed the arms industry was in universities. You see it, it's very open in university life, right? You often see it at uh, freshers' fairs when we go along with our paper. Yeah. To, uh, to attract people to our various Marxist societies across the country. You often see the army strutting around. Sometimes you see arms traders strutting around as well <laughs> and uh, inviting people to um, arms fairs that are regularly put on. But I would say that from the, the research I've been doing, it's mainly been reading stuff on Demilitarized Education's website, mm -hmm. uh, Declassified UK as well. Mm -hmm. uh, as, we, uh, as far as we know, over a billion pounds worth of partnerships are, are to be found between universities and arms companies, which is staggering when it's you insane. think about it. Yeah. And yet, as you say, part of it is through the, the direct financing from either Barclays or, or BlackRock, these third parties, sometimes just money from BAE Systems or Leonardo, Rolls-Royce. But a, a big part of it is in the form of research projects, as mm. they call them. Mm. And it's the arms industry's way of molding education in its own image, um, of turning education into, uh, yeah, this, this, uh, this training ground for um, people that will go on to work in these industries yeah. and also a hunting ground for, uh, for universities as, uh, university students as well. When I was in Sheffield, one of the students was telling me they were an engineering student and they were talking about how, you know, you have these companies and they're <clears throat> essentially in classes, they're invited onto campus specifically to try and recruit students and, and just kind of lure them in to um, these. It's, it's both the army does that and mm. also the arms manufacturers as well. Um, and yeah, we had a, a great discussion about how students can protest against that and try and refuse engagement with those people yeah. but with the recognition that this isn't something that can be solved just through one class or like one engineering module yeah, right yeah. this is about how our universities run on mm. what who is deciding and who you know who's made the decision that yeah these arms manufacturers should ha play such a massive role in these departments yeah um, which is certainly really, not the students. <laughs> well, exactly. And that's a, a big part of, you know, how we as like revolutionaries have, have kind of approached, I would say the universities for the last like 10 years, because look, over the last 10 years, there's been an increase 
in the marketization of yes. higher education. Um, universities are not immune from capitalism, um, despite the fact that we might like to think that education, healthcare, you know, these are all social goods, right? That's the way that they try spin it. Yeah, but under capitalism, especially capitalism today, that means everything is open for for privatization. Everything's open for business. I think so, yeah. that that's definitely uh, the case, and. There's obviously been military links between, you know, the interests of the ruling class and universities in the past. Um, but I, it really, really began to explode with the explosion of marketization, as you mentioned. Yeah. It was under Margaret Thatcher's government that um, they, they saw universities as these costly white elephants that, you know, people would go there, study humanities. That, that wasn't good for industry. Yeah. And so it was about kind of repurposing universities for... Um, closer ties to big business which couldn't be a bad thing in the eyes of the capitalists could it yeah and what that has looked like is defense contractors preying upon university students university departments molding them in in their own image mm -hmm. and this has been i would say consciously guided by a go the government cutting funding again and again and again to the point now where as you were describing it is a systemic issue universities go cap in hand to all, a whole host of you know dodgy corporations uh, in order to receive funding on the one hand. And then these corporations and uh, the arms trade in particular, they then uh, ensure that there is good graduate recruitment statistics, which is a really important way in which universities are, are, um, are judged and, and that kind of thing. So they've, they've managed to really prize open universities for their own cynical interests. And this goes hand in hand with, uh, I think, where research would always tend under a system that bases itself on violence and war. Yeah, that's exactly, like, prize open is exactly it. It's like vultures, yes. <laughs> basically. Um, because as you say, in Starmer's, they're not, they're, the government is not going to give more funding to universities. And universities, there was a report that showed, I think, like, 40% of UK universities are on the verge of bankruptcy yes. this year, um, which is insane. And if they're existing in a system which is also lurching towards war, mm. then there's no wonder that these arms manufacturers and companies are playing more and more of a role then within, within these universities. Um, but there's a problem here, right? Which is you've got universities on the brink of bankruptcy. One of the most politicized generations mm. of students going into university and they are, why are they so political? One, they're seeing horrors every single day on their screens. Mm. Um, but also they're living in a system in which capitalism is constantly collapsing in on them. Yeah. They're being told you've got to pay, you know, crazy high tuition fees, with crazy interest. high with interest, crazy high rent, um, many of whom have to get second jobs. All mm. of this stuff is happening. Oh, and also, I hope you don't mind, we've got this war department yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, in the university. Quite literally in some cases. Like when, when I was doing some research, uh, I came across King's College London, yeah. uh, prestigious war studies department, prestigious. which was quite literally made for the purposes of training up the next layer of uh, generals, spies, yeah. teaching them the dark arts of espionage and yeah. so-called diplomacy as well. And um, this department actually offered to the despotic regimes of the Arab world for them to train up the spies in, in North London. Mm. High rank, high security uh, meetings take place with the army on site, on campus as well. Mm. What we've seen is a militarization of universities. Yeah, I know all about, well, kind of, because I went to SOAS. Oh yeah, <laughs> for your sins. <laughs> for my sins. Um, and SOAS is a really interesting university because it prides itself today and actually markets itself on yeah. being this radical decolonial space for thought um, celebrating in particular the achievements of the global south and so on um, but actually historically was literally set up to spy on you know to train people so that they could go to the colonial world mm -hmm. and, and learn their languages that's the other thing about SAS which is so funny is that it's, you know, when I went anyway, unfortunately, a lot of the courses are being cut. But it's got this amazing array of, of languages that you mm. can learn. Um, but that historically is entirely rooted in its colonial past. Yeah. And but it tries to kind of it tried to repurpose itself or remarket itself. But we just have to look at how they 
reacted to the encampment, uh, yeah. the SARS encampment, uh, that just shows the complete utter shallowness of, of any kind of university management. I mean, it's just following the logic of the system, but they clamp down so hard. A lot of students have been suspended. They are still suspended um, for, for their activity in the mm. Palestine encampment. Um, it just shows the hypocrisy. Yeah, it's truly, it's truly disgraceful uh, that these institutions model themselves as there for critical thought. Yeah, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, of course, is part and parcel. That's a big part of how they market themselves, as you say. You know, mm. they're, they're also, the the bureaucrats really model and universities. I brought it up. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I lapped it up when I was yeah. there. I'm like, yes, I'm gonna be a radical. Oh and no. <laughs> yeah, me. they t- they try rein in it a little bit, yeah. but I think. Um, that's why so much anger uh, can be found on campus with regard yeah. to this issue of Palestine. Because, yeah, as you say, it's on the minds of students in a way that I don't think any war in our lifetime has really been there. Like it, it generated this movement of a generation yeah. in many ways. And these universities are very happy to, to be complicit in the crimes. And it throws up questions about who runs the university, mm-hmm. to come back to what the point you were making earlier. Because the university management are really a pack of bureaucrats that are not elected and not really accountable to the student base or the faculty staff. And they themselves are driven by their bottom line, which is profitability. That's why they're happy to invite this host of, uh, well, this rogues gallery really of uh, people from the arms industry onto campus, why they're happy to make um, partnerships with Israeli universities. Whilst we should add, there is no functional universities in Gaza because of course it's been bombed to to smithereens. And um, I think that's what the movement began to actually throw up questions of, divestment and disclosure, saying we want to know so that we can break our complicity uh, in the ongoing genocide and, go- and and companies that really contravene international law, which of course these universities have de- special departments on, mm. on these kind of things. Yeah. And you must have found this on your tour, uh, yes. a lot of this anger. So yeah, I just wanted to ask how, how had it been? Yes, yeah, no, I mean, cause look, what we're saying is that the universities are gonna continue to be a, a, a hotbed of struggle because you've got this really angry layer of students and, and and university management acting in this in this way and so on the tour what i've met overwhelmingly is students who just want to know what to do mm. like what can we do about it they don't need in the main convincing that isn't it bad that the university is investing in this way um what they're interested in is is organization but mm. not just in a kind of um impatient way and what i mean by that is what I have found is people that are desperate to like ask questions, yep. um, learn about how is it, you know, these questions we ask, like, you know, why is Israel able to get away with it, um, continue to act with this impunity? Um, because look, a big part of what I try and explain or have explained on the Books Not Bombs tour is that the fight against British imperialism is the fight for the socialist revolution in Britain, yeah. right? That the fight against British imperialism is the class struggle yeah. in Britain. Because if the workers of Britain were able to collectively organize themselves and stop, whether it's weapons, although that's the kind of, you know, not the major part of the Israeli war machine, but still plays a role, um, whether it's weapons or, or political sport or whatever it is, uh, it's the workers themselves that hold the keys to the infrastructure of British imperialism in a way. And that doesn't mean in a kind of morally condemnation to morally condemn the British working class in that sense, but it's to recognize literally what their what their role is and, and more importantly, what their power is. And so across the whole tour, the discussion then moves on to, well, how could a revolution take place in Britain? And will a revolution take place in Britain? I would say that has been the most common theme and the most common question. Mm. Actually, last night I was in LSE speaking on, uh, it was a kind of a panel about imperialism in Africa, also because it's Black History Month. And one of the questions was, and there was a few questions along these lines, like how do we convince the working class in Britain or the working class of of the West um, to fight against its own imperialists and essentially engage in struggle. 
um which is which is kind of like the existential question yeah. obviously that we ask ourselves as communists um but also yeah specifically on this thing of how do we convince uh, the working class that they don't gain from imperialism because yeah, yeah. there's a slight ideological struggle there as well yeah no I, how would you answer that that's a really interesting question because i think for a very long time um the ruling class has sought to convince the workers that their imperialist plunder is in their interests and it, it reminds me of something that um i think lenin quoted in imperialism where he talks about cecil rhodes walking around the east end where we're shooting this podcast and seeing some workers that were calling for bread. And he, he writes to his friend uh, at the time that seeing this gave him the belief that Britain needs to loot more of the world. It needs to, it needs to increase its share as you know, the major slave, uh, slave owner of the colonies and, and this kind of thing. So it was basically saying that we can only alleviate the poverty and stave off any kind of social crisis or class struggle at home by conquering and plundering. But as that example shows, the working class was not benefiting at that point. Yeah. They managed to buy off uh, a layer of the working class leadership. That is definitely true. But I think today it's very obvious that the imperialist designs and the imperialist adventures that Britain is happy to follow America uh, into is not really in the benefit of the working class whatsoever. I mean, we've seen in Starmer's government, it must be past 100 days since he came to power now, yeah. Um, the two-child uh, benefit cap um, remain. We've also seen the, the winter fuel uh, allowance being cut for pensioners. And there's a whole host of attacks that he has up his sleeve. I mean, it all, it's all part of his tough decisions, right? Yeah, so tough. But it, it's, it's never so tough great. to send more billions to Ukraine. No. And it's never tough to uh, provide as much support as Israel ne needs yes. in quite literally you know, scrambling the RAF to, to support Israel when it was facing the retaliatory attacks from Iran. Yeah. There's always money for war, for, but there's never money for the, the, the crises at home. And that's the situation that I think people can see very clearly. A hundred percent. And I think it's the working class leadership that is, is trying to keep a lid on this, right? Um, we saw very little in the way of statements, pro-Palestine statements coming out of the trade unions. Yeah. If anything, they try to demobilize their members and it's meant that they've, they've tried to take matters into their own hands, organizing like one day boycotts of uh, arms factories and this kind of thing, yeah. which shows the mood that is there. And I think they're going to really struggle to keep a lid on this class anger, which we saw emerged only two years ago in the, the massive strike wave. I think they can expect something like that on a much bigger scale where imperialism, war is really going to be at the forefront of people's minds. Exactly. And yeah, that's basically what I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in res Like this thing of, you know, how can we convince the working class? It's actually, well, look, there is an ideological struggle. Clearly, we engage in an ideological struggle against the ruling class every single day. However, we also recognize that it's actually the conditions of capitalism themselves today which is moving the working class against war, right? Which is kind of doing half the job for us, if you want to put it that way. There is a deep anti-war sentiment that is brewing around the world mm. in Britain and in America, clearly, right? Um, you know, I think we were talking about this on the podcast a couple of weeks ago about, uh, you know, the, the, the floods and all these horrific like weather events and people's, you know, lives being ruined and the government's only giving a bit of money to that whilst also saying, here's a few more billion to Israel and to Ukraine. And so this thing of like, how can we convince the working, actually like there is deep anger. The question is who's gonna take advantage of that? Yeah. Um, actually, I think it was the AFD in Germany, which was able to win seats on this question on the back of, you know, how much money are we giving to Ukraine? Exactly. Um, and, and what does that mean for us here? Yeah. yeah. And it's the same with Trump in America. He, part of his appeal in a distorted way is this idea that he's somehow anti-war mm. <laughs> and anti-foreign intervention, which connects with a mood in society um, amongst the working class. And this makes the the moment that the, that the ruling class finds itself in, in Britain and in the West more generally, very, very fragile because it's on this lurch towards war with a generation of people who were angry anyway because of the conditions of capitalism and now they're making it even worse. Yeah. They're completely out of step with the youth. And you're, you're completely right. I mean, 
we've said it many times before, Starmer's government is a government of war. Yeah. It is one that is finding billions for many different wars, is, is beginning to, to threaten and, and uh, saber rattle with, with other nations. I mean, there was a, a British uh, general that was recently saying that in three years' time, we're going to be at war with Iran and China and yes. Russia and all of... I mean, I hope we aren't. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's probably a bit sensationalist, but it, it yeah. shows what their priorities are. Yeah. At the same time, as, as, you, as you were describing, that people want an end to war. They want a meaningful peace, but they can see that that is not in the interest of the imperialists. And you, no matter how many times we've come out onto the streets protesting, we can't dissuade the imperialists from being imperialist. And so they're look, I think people are look, beginning to look around and see that there is an enormous um, issue opening up in society for the ruling class where they're not bringing people along in step with their grand designs and with where they're wanting to drag the world into further and further barbarism. And that's going to be the generation, really, that yeah. will change things. Yeah. And so, yeah, as you say, how will the war end? How will any war end? It's not through appealing to the to the capitalists or, or imperialists through moral means or anything like this. It can only really be through revolution, yeah. right? And this is a, a key theme that's come up throughout the tour. I found myself in discussion with people and they almost automatically are reaching to the word and idea of revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think perhaps not every, well, clearly, not everyone is going to have a conscious definition of what is a revolution and that's something that we get asked a lot as well as 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 revolutionaries as communists um and i was asked a lot on this tour uh what is what is a revolution and i think for us we often go back to what leon trotsky said about revolution it's the moment where um the typically apathetic masses that don't really take any interest in politics they don't think it takes any interest in their lives as well they overcome this feeling of helplessness and they crash onto the stage of history, which as you were describing before, is entirely um, created by the crisis of capitalism, by the instability that's found in the DNA of the system itself. And it's at moments like that when the masses begin to realize their, uh, their power and can topple regimes that they've live un lived under for the, the entirety of their lives in some cases, uh, up in society, turn the world upside down. It's in moments like that that the workers can really begin to to feel their strength and see that society doesn't need to be the way that it currently looks. Yeah. And we've seen many of those um, over over the past couple of years. Um, and of course, at Revolution Festival, we'll be talking about the very recent ones in Bangladesh, for instance. But again and again, it throws up the question of a revolutionary leadership. And um, I think at Revolution Festival, with this uh, this anti-imperialist day, we're going to be discussing a lot about how we have the clearest ideas that then can be harnessed by the Revolutionary Party, which is the vehicle for these ideas, to inject it into the movement. And of course, you're going to be speaking at the closing rally of, uh, of the Saturday night. Yes, yeah, I will. And what are we going to try and draw out? It's that, yeah, the world is on fire, literally in the sense of horrific, barbaric wars, but also politically in terms of what that is doing to consciousness above all amongst young people. Mm. Um, and and, and that, that tour has, this tour rather, has confirmed this for me um, more than any other time. And I've been doing this for a few years, <laughs> not as long as some other people, but we really mean it when we say that there is, there is something different in the air right now, especially amongst young people and especially in connection with this idea of revolution. I mean, the definition and explanation you just gave is is was was very very was very very apt and describes what just happened a couple of months ago in Bangladesh, mm. which began with students. Yes. What I've really loved about this tour is is talking about actually um, the revolution in Bangladesh and saying yeah it began with students on campus and then it spread mm. to millions of people, and I think that that kind of thing doesn't happen every day. We can't exaggerate it, but it's going to happen more. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to happen more in our lifetime, given the conditions of capitalism today. However, there's no guarantee, and in fact, well, yeah, there's no guarantee that those revolutions will automatically solve the, the problems or the contradictions that people are, are protesting over in the first place. And yeah, and this is where this question of revolution leadership comes in. And, and at the rally on Saturday night, I'm going to try and 
map out, you know, what is this this Gen Z revolution that, that, that seems to be taking place? Bangladesh, Indonesia, Nigeria, Kenya. You know, it's true that these are more than just your, your, your average protest with a placard, you know? Mm. <laughs> There's something deeper happening. It's true that it's it's happening quicker, you could say, in, in countries which are like hyper exploited by imperialism. But but the point is the process, that fundamental process is happening all over the world and it's happening in Britain. And we see it every day in the RCP, in the people that we've met. I've seen it for the last six weeks in the students that we've met, um, over a hundred of whom have joined the party. As well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> welcome Great. comrades. Yeah, um, but we need more. We need more and we've got to show these people that revolutions by themselves won't change everything we need about society we have to consciously do that with a party yeah. with a program and with a leadership um but i'm excited for rev fest i'm excited for the rally to kind of draw out the the anatomy of, of, of the gen z revolutionary today yeah yeah and and how that is not something innate, but it is literally the world around us, events around us, which are dragging people into struggle. Um, and I'll kind of end on this point because in um, in Cambridge, one of the questions that was asked was about bravery. Mm -hmm. um, someone was saying, they actually said like, I'm not sure that they were American and they said something like, uh, I don't know if people are brave enough in America or to, you know, to break from, capitalism basically um and then someone else said yeah i also think maybe people aren't brave enough in britain <laughs> i was like guys you know what is bravery right like let's be let's be real bravery also it's not just a randomness in people it comes through struggle mm. and if you study first of all the history of the working class in america or britain you will find bravery and, and you sacrifice. will find sacrifice the most you know unimaginable levels of sacrifice that people are willing to, to commit to through struggle itself because they realize there's no other option. Mm. So I have no fears or worries about whether or not people will culturally break out of, you know, a comfort that, 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 that capitalism produces because capitalism does not produce that anymore. Yeah. There is no more comfort. There is just worsening living standards and, and people's consciousness changing off the back of that. Um, and they agreed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With, with, I, with me and I with think us. what you've just described is the basis of our revolutionary optimism yeah. as a party and yeah. on an individual level as well. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for debriefing Books Not Bombs with me. No worries at all. <laughs> um, and yeah, so just another kind of call out to everyone. Please do come along to the Revolution Festival. Um, it starts from Friday all the way to Sunday. It's the 15th to the 17th of November. Um, the rally's on the 16th in the evening, but we'd really encourage you to come to the whole thing to get the most holistic understanding of Marxism, basically, and anti-imperialism as well. So thanks very much. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. <laughs>